Thank you for being with us tonight. It's hard to believe that the year is drawing to a close. Just incredible how time flies. We've been very busy here at the museum over the last year. We've reinterpreted a few of our permanent exhibitions, have added some wonderful new pieces, including the gift of a beautiful Napoleonic war bone ship model. Um, this gallery that we are standing in has featured some wonderful exhibits this year. We explored um, sailors' art. We also had our judge show of high school student art. And right now in the gallery, these are some of our most beautiful works that have been off of view um, for probably about 20 years. So this is our exhibition called 1991. So 1991 is the year the museum started, and we wanted to reflect back on that and the collection, and really why the museum got started was because of its artwork. 2022 is already shaping up to be a great year. Um, our first exhibit, starting January 4th, will be Coast Guard Art. This is art done by actual members of the Coast Guard, and it really depicts them in their day-to-day -day work and service to this country. More of our events will be back in 2022, including our celebration of the whales in March. So keep an eye on our website and Facebook if you follow social media, um, because there will be some of our great events are coming back. Tonight we're happy to host another speaker series event, and we are very pleased to welcome author and historian Barbara Brooks Tomblin. Barbara is a naval and military historian and author of several books. She has a doctorate in American history from Rutgers University, where she was a lecturer in military history. The Civil War is often considered a, social, a soldier's war, but Barbara Tomlin's book, Life in Jefferson Davis's Navy, acknowledges the legacy of service of the officers and sailors of the Confederate States Navy. Tomblin offers a fresh look at the wartime experiences of the officers and men in the Confederate Navy, including those who served on gunboats, ironclads, and ships on western rivers and along the coast and at Mo Beal Bay, as well as those who sailed on the high seas aboard the Confederate raiders Sumter, Alabama, Florida, and Shenandoah. Please welcome Barbara Brooks Tomblin. Well, it's great to see all of you and to be here and to be back at the museum. It's been a couple of years for sure. And um, you know, I'm really grateful that you've given the opportunity to talk to you about this book. Um, I wanted to start off by explaining how I came to write a book about the Confederate States Navy. Um, I was explaining to Audrey that uh, my family, uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and if not abolitionists, we were certainly not southern, um, even though it was southern Ohio. Uh, the Ohio River divides Cincinnati from Kentucky, and when I was growing up, the people in Kentucky were southerners. They were, if not rebels, they were whatever. So a number of years ago, I was at the Naval History Symposium in Annapolis, and Dennis Ringel, who wrote Life in uh, Mr. Lincoln's Navy, we were discussing at the uh, banquet afterwards um, about the fact that there had been so few Civil War talks and presentations at that particular symposium. The Navy uh, at that point was focusing on remembering and celebrating and doing research in the War of 1812. So we felt like we were left out. And Dennis said, you know, nobody's written about life in Jefferson Davis's Navy or about the Confederate States Navy. And I said, well, why don't you, Dennis? You wrote about Mr. Lincoln. And he said, well, you know, there just really aren't as many letters and diaries and journals, and is, there just isn't enough information. Why don't you try it? <laughs> and I said, I think that would be a bit like being a traitor or something. I, I, don't, mm, I don't think that, that, that's not right. Let me think about that. So I took my glass of wine and I walked to the end of Alumni Hall, which is way further than down there, and thought, well, if you're a historian and you have an opportunity to research and write about something that seems to be needed, just do it. <laughs> so I did, in part because I had just written and or just published 
the Civil War on the Mississippi. And of course, if you're going to write about opening the river, the Mississippi in the Civil War, you're going to be discussing the Arkansas and other uh, Battle of Plum Point. Um, I think I even talked a little bit later about Mobile Bay, but I had done some work in that subject on the Confederates, and I thought maybe it would be interesting to write about the enemy, <laughs> write about the other side, if I can find enough information. And that turned out, of course, to be the challenge. And I was just looking, I, I had to reread my own book before I came tonight. It's been a while since I wrote it, and, and even longer since I researched it. Anyway, so I did call it Life in Jefferson Davis's Navy, hoping that the Naval Institute Press would pair it up with Dennis's book. So we have both President Jefferson Davis and, and Abraham Lincoln when, and their navies. Um, I wanted to talk uh, um, about, first about the fact that I did, in fact, find a lot of information. Um, if you're a historian, the first thing you want to do is look and see what's been already been written. And uh, Thomas Scharf, who was a midshipman uh, um, during the war, later wrote a history of the Confederate Navy, but that was in 1887, kind of a long time ago. Um, William Still uh, Jr. Um, edited an inf uh, a large book, which I started to bring, but it's so heavy, <laughs> called The Confederate Navy, The Organization of the Confederate Navy, and it had chapters on varying things and some good pictures, but when you read it, you would come to the end of some of the chapters and say, well, that isn't a lot of information. And more than that, what I like to do when I write is to see if I can't quote the people who actually experienced life in Jefferson Davis's Navy or life on the Mississippi, or I have two books, I have two books, my first two books are World War II, so I do a lot of World War II history. I wanna know what they said, not what somebody paraphrased they said. <laughs> so you have to go and find letters and journals, um, some kind of manuscripts um, that will allow you to quote whenever you can what they remembered or what they talked about. And uh, in the case of uh, the Confederate States Navy, we were lucky because there have been some books. Um, Trotter wrote a book called uh, Ironclads and Columbiads. Stephen Weiss wrote Lifeline of the Confederacy about blockade runners. There have been a lot of articles, if you're familiar with Civil War history, battles and leaders, been articles in, in that. Um, but what I wanted was, as I said, memoirs, journals, letters, and we're lucky to find quite a few of them. Um, they're all in the, you know, back in the bibliography, but just to mention a few, uh, George Weber and John W. Rush, uh, who wrote uh, some letters from Camp Chase, the prisoner of war camp in Ohio. Willie Wilson, uh, who was a young fellow, uh, a young midshipman. His mother um, saved his letters. Uh, Robert Watson, the Iversons, um, and of course all of the raider captains, the more famous ones, wrote either had biographies or autobiographies. Um, and that, I think, went a long way to, um, to helping try and capture, you know, vividly capture what they experienced. It, it's, it's uh, I think, um, important to do that. And there were a few, a few battles, there were a few experiences in which you couldn't find anything. So one of the things I did toward the end of my research was I started thinking, you, I wonder if any of the little towns in the South have journals or letters that they're hiding in their historical society or their library that they have not sent on to Atlanta or you know whatever the capital where there is a big library of collections. So I wrote to quite a few and nobody wrote back and said they had anything. But what we all as historians love to get and hope and pray we'll get is another batch, another, another journal, uh, the letters that were never discovered um, that haven't been used. Um, and I think we all keep hoping that. So if you know of any <laughs> uh, about anything, you know, turn it over to somebody who, would, who could use it. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm working on another book right now that I started and then stopped <laughs> um, uh, 
called Brothers in the Lord, because um, one of my earlier books was Blue Jackets and Contrabands, which was about African Americans in the Union Navy off the uh, North and South blockading squadron off the coast, the East Coast during the Civil War. And um, this one is about the Mississippi and uh, both African Americans and uh, their cooperation, um, how they were used or rescued or not um, by both soldiers, Union soldiers, Union Army, and Union Navy. And when I, one of the reasons I did that is someone in Camarillo, I live in Camarillo, and I didn't keep it, she, I must have copied from it. Um, she has a, um, a diary that was kept by Ma Milo Dibble, I think it was her husband's relative, and he kept a wonderful diary of his experiences in the West uh, along the Mississippi during the war. And you come, to, you come to get to know this young man, and you're reading along, and suddenly it's the Battle of Champions Hill, and he's killed. And I was thinking today, you feel like you've lost a friend. <laughs> I mean, he, no, he, he can't have died. <laughs> I just read his diary. Um, but that's how vivid it is when you're, you know, I think when you're reading something that, um, that he was recording. Um, and that was a wonderful find. I just wish we all had, had more. And I know the other thing that I wanted to say, too, about sources is the Union Army and the Confederate Army probably, too, but especially the Union Army, we have a lot more letters, a lot more material and manuscript collections from soldiers than we do from sailors. And one of the reasons I think, I'm not sure, but I do think that a good many sailors were, if not illiterate, they were not writing home. Um, many of the sailors that were recruited uh, and joined the Confederate States Navy were not Americans, they were foreigners. They were taken off prize vessel, vessels like whaling ships. Um, they were recruited um, in Europe, uh, they came from all over, and uh, I think many of them were probably not particularly fluent, in, possibly in English. The other thing that happens with the Confederacy is that there, many of the records were lost um, in Richmond and other places. But I'm sure that somewhere out there in somebody's household, they have a sailor or a midshipman or a young officer's letters or journals. I hope those will eventually come out because they'll tell us even more about, you know, about what happened. Um, one of the things that I think, there are a lot, of, a lot of legacy about the Confederate States Navy, but the one thing that I was reminded thinking about all of the book today and yesterday was the fact that when the South seceded and they decided that they needed a Navy <laughs> and, and raised an army, they were doing it from scratch. Um, they really didn't have much to start with. The one thing they did have was a, a wealth of officers. 259 Southern officers who were in the US Navy resigned. Or if they didn't resign, <laughs> um, the uh, um, Union convinced them that they should. <laughs> there were also a number, about 44% of the Naval Academy, US Naval Academy, at the time of the Civil War in 1861, about 44% of the midshipmen then were Southerners. And some of them resigned. And what I thought was quite it was a lot of surprises doing this research. One of the surprises for me was the fact that the fathers of these midshipmen wrote the Secretary of the Navy and said, I, I guess on behalf of my son, he's resigning as a midshipman. <laughs> and I kind of wondered when I read that, you think they asked the boy first? <laughs> they just said, you're resigning. <laughs> um, there was a lot of, um, so there were a lot of sailors that were recruited. Um, they had a lot of officers. Many of them, of course, were now senior officers. And when they joined the Confederate States Navy, I'm sure they wanted a, a, a naval station. They wanted a ship. There weren't very many ships for them. They had a lot of officers, but they didn't have a lot of men in part because the South really did not have that many uh, seamen and mariners. The North had many more. Um, so they had to figure out, how do we recruit people? And they set up um, what they called rendezvous. Um, recruit, we'd call them a recruiting station, recruiters, in certain towns, particularly um, the ones, uh, Charleston, Mobile, um, Savannah, places where there might be seamen of some kind. And um, you know, encouraged them to enlist. 
They had a lot of trouble coming up with enough men. There was a manpower shortage both in the North and the Union Navy and, and the Confederate States Navy, um, in part because the Army either managed to recruit soldiers or eventually drafted them. And they tended to draft people who were seamen or mariners, especially in the West, and put them in the Army. At one point, um, the Secretary of the Navy, the Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, actually came up with a, um, a way of getting the Confederacy to demand that these men be turned over from Army regiments who had experience as seamen or mariners. And naturally, the generals all went, uh-uh. <laughs> they were supposed to turn over some 2,000, and they, they wouldn't do it. They simply said, we're not doing it. Um, so they were always looking, constantly looking. Um, they had some wonderful recruiting posters that sometimes promised um, all kinds of things. Or they were recruiting posters that were very specific. We need carpenters. We need gunners. Um, we need um, a clerk. Um, and sometimes they would promise them. Uh, they always held out the hope of prize money, of course. The other way that uh, they found a lot of uh, seamen is the Confederate raiders like the Florida, the Sumter, Senandoah. Um, when they captured a prize vessel, they often convinced the crew of the prize vessel, <laughs> we can put you ashore or maybe you could join our crew and you'll get prize money. So they tried to lure them uh, with some success um, to try and find men. Um, I do think some of them were pulled out of uh, pubs and places in England at some point. Um, but they were always, always looking for, particularly as you built more ships, you had to have more men. And they didn't have to serve forever. I, you know, it was for a year, and then they were discharged, or they died, <laughs> or they deserted. Um, discipline was always a problem, of course. It's always a problem in the Army and Navy. And desertion was common both in the Union Navy and the Confederate Navy. Not like it is when the Army, but they did desert, um, particularly, of course, toward the end of the war. Um, many of them, uh, toward the end of the war, uh, were getting fleeting letters, distraught letters from their families saying, please come home. Um, we need to be protected. We need to be helped. Um, you know, that's the wives and, and maybe the older people. They're trying to keep the home going, the f businesses going, and probably the farms going. And toward the end of the war, what I thought was very surprising is some of these soldiers um, deserted. They went home to check on their families. One of them, the one famous story, is a man named Billy Bug, who was an African-American pilot, went home to check on his family. They seemed to be okay, evidently, and he came back, knowing that if he you know, came back, he could be punished. And they said, that's okay, fine. <laughs> we understand. We understand he went home. And what I thought was... I would not have thought of this, but especially toward the end of the war when you've got Union soldiers um, that have, you know, come all the way in, into a lot of, uh, of North Carolina and South Carolina states, Confederate states, um, they're harassing and they're marauding their own people as well as the Union. So, you, you know, your wife with your kids or your grandma and you're in your farm and they're stealing your cattle or whatever chickens or whatever they can, and they could be uh, rebels and they could be Union Yankees. So these people really were desperate, particularly toward the end, and I could understand why a lot of, a lot of fellows went home. They also probably were just tired of the war. <laughs> um, so desertion was a, a problem as well. Um, and um, the other thing that I think a lot of people ask or have asked me and I thought about it a lot is, were the daily routines and the regulations of the Confederate States Navy very different from the U.S. Navy? As I said, a lot of the officers um, had been trained and been in the U.S. Navy for a long time when they went to the Confederacy. But the average, um, the average sailor, the average seaman, um, petty officers, um, were pretty much doing the same thing, not only that you might be doing if you were a seaman, a mariner in a civilian vessel, but on shipboard um, in a Confederate ship, a gunboat, or a ram, or an ironclad, um, 
what sailors do. They slept in hammocks, they holy stoned the deck, they polished the bright work. At night, when they were off duty, they enjoyed fiddling and dancing. Evidently, music was a big deal, um, especially fiddling, anybody who could be a fiddler. Um, they liked to write home, those who could write home and receive letters. Everybody loves mail, and they often, particularly the officers, a lot of the memories, a lot of the information in the book uh, comes from midshipmen and from officers, because as I said, there weren't too many uh, uh, sailors who left us letters and, and, and journals, a few, but not as many as we'd like. Um, they did, of course, like going ashore on liberty when they could, and they did read newspapers. They often, particularly officers, talk about reading newspapers, that even if they were old, they wanted to know what was going on, and they loved getting newspapers. Um, of course, both Union and Confederate uh, seamen and officers drilled at the guns and um, learned how to repel borders. Um, some of them learned how to march and carry a rifle. Um, so they were busy doing that. The one big difference um, between the two navies in terms of the routine daily life of, of a sailor in the Confederate States Navy is they got their daily grog ration. <laughs> you know, grog, the gill of rum and water. They were given out twice a day, uh, but the U.S. Navy discontinued the grog ration, uh, the rum ration, in uh, September of 1862. So the Confederates kept it going, and I'm um, sure that made a lot of people happy. <laughs> Usually does. <laughs> um, the uh, I was talking about discipline a minute ago. I think the Importance, of course, um, in a ship is to have discipline. The commanding officer was responsible for discipline, but he usually turned it over to the first lieutenant or the luff. Um, and um, there were a number of um, reasons, of course, that men got themselves in trouble. <laughs> um, one of them, of course, was alcohol. Um, occasionally they got it smuggled on board ship, but most of the time is they went ashore, they got drunk, or if they got drunk, they got in a fight. Um, and then many times, either if they weren't drunk, um, they would miss the boat back to their ship. This happened in World War II a lot too, you know. <laughs> uh, probably World War I as well. Um, so they were in trouble because they did not get back. They overstayed their leave. Um, and uh, they didn't get back, so they were obviously going to have to be punished in some way. Uh, there were a lot of ways that um, the Confederate States Navy punished infractions of, of the rules and regulations. You could be denied your grog ration. You could be reduced in rank. That happened to a number of guys that we know about. Um, they could be placed in irons. They could be confined on bread and water. They could forfeit their prize money. Ooh, that would hurt. Triced up, um, one of them I thought I'd never heard of until I was reading this. They could scrub them down with hickory brooms, scrub them real clean and so they'd be wet, and then they'd be set up the main rigging, spread-eagled, and left to dry. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to do whatever I did bad you know, <laughs> after that one. Um, I love the story, and I, if I can find it on uh, the Alabama's, uh, maybe I can read it, uh, little powder monkeys, you know, the, the young fellows who brought the powder up um, were called powder monkeys, and this young fellow had a very interesting story um, about what happened. Um, he, um, he was on the Alabama, he was one of the boys, the powder monkeys, and um, his name was Robert Egan. He was one of the toughest boys uh, on the ship, reputation of mischief. He was accused of stealing the Alabama's beloved pet cat. He was hauled up the mast and charged with knowing or abetting the disappearance of a cat. To prod his memory, Egan was spread eagled on the mizzen rigging barefooted, a common punishment for powder monkeys. He steadfastly denied any knowledge about the missing cat. But suddenly a sail was sighted, and the after pivot gun was run out, and the tampion was removed from the muzzle. Out jumped the cat. <laughs> I have five cats, so it didn't surprise me that's where he was hiding. Anyway, asked why he put the kitty in the gun, Egan replied, quote, oh, to see what effect the firing would have on the cat. Oddly enough, Egan later deserted at the Cape of Good Hope. <laughs> he was a mischievous guy, but I love to see this cat going <laughs> zooming out of the thing. Um, so they did have, you know, the, and I love stories like that because to me it just makes the whole experience of them 
much more real. You know, it's one thing to read history and it's all paraphrased, but it's much more fun and, and more, I think, exciting to hear stories like that. Um, the uh, Confederate sailors and officers um, faced a, a whole host of challenges during the war. Um, one of the most important first ones was seasickness. And I have a story about a fellow in here that was very seasick for a while. Um, sometimes the diet was very poor. Uh, if you were lucky enough to be um, aboard a ship uh, or a gunboat or something, <laughs> um, near the coast or particularly in the rivers, you could go ashore, you could get food, you could buy fresh vegetables and food. But if you were on a Confederate raider and you were at sea for a long period of time, you often really did have a very poor, unhealthy diet. Um, Obviously, there was the possibility that you could be wounded or you could fall and be hurt. Um, and it wasn't totally uncommon for officers. Um, I think we had a picture of Franklin Buchanan somewhere. Anyway, um, maybe it was downstairs. Um, Buchanan um, actually was shot in the thigh and, and wounded. He recovered. They thought they might have to amputate his leg, but they saved him. And Raphael Sims um, fell down a ladder <laughs> and was unconscious um, and kind of out of it for a few days. Um, and if you, you know, climb around on ships very much and you think the captain slipped and fell down the ladder, I mean, I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> that was, but that could happen, uh, even though he was the, the captain, the commanding officer of the ship. Um, Boredom was always a problem. Morale was always a problem. Um, the other thing that you read a lot about because of the southern climate, and this was true in the Mississippi as well as along the coast and many of the inland rivers, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes were a huge problem because, for one thing, they, they didn't understand it, but, of course, they were bearing illnesses like malaria. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about medical, uh, the whole medical um, situation, because I thought that was quite interesting. Um, there, of course, uh, men, Navy men suffered from the usual, even pneumonia, respiratory illnesses, gastrointestinal problems, a lot of dysentery sometimes, venereal disease. Um, and there were a number of very fatal, um, possibly fatal illnesses that Navy surgeons and uh, hospital stewards had to deal with during the war on both sides, but in the Confederacy, of course. Yellow fever was not uncommon. In the city of New Orleans had huge, uh, in the 1850s, had several big epidemics of yellow fever. Um, there, but there was typhoid and typhus, smallpox, malaria, as I mentioned. There were a lot of fevers. They called them ague, um, in intermittent fevers that affected sailors and and soldiers too, I suppose, and scurvy and tuberculosis. Um, I talked about a poor diet. Scurvy was something, and of course, you know, the Royal Navy had figured out with the limes, although it turns out lemons were actually better than limes. Um, but if you're lacking in fresh vegetables, as many of the raiders did, or in uh, other ships, particularly toward the end of the war when the, block, the Union blockade wasn't particularly good in the beginning, but as the war went on and toward the end of the war, it had tightened. It was harder to get, get supplies. Um, there were cases of scurvy. Um, and uh, a number, um, a number of uh, smallpox people, had, especially in prisons, um, suffered from smallpox. So it kept, uh, it kept the doctors busy. The Navy uh, began um, a similar... Um, the Office of uh, Medicine and Surgery, they started their own, like the Union Navy had, the U.S. Navy had, um, and a number of hospitals. They also used hospital boats, especially on the Mississippi. There's a wonderful book, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but it's called The Wounded River, and by a man named Lauderdale, about the hospital ship that he was on. He kept a very detailed journal of what he was doing. Um, they used them to transfer them, say, up the Mississippi, particularly to hospitals. There was a big hospital in Memphis. Um, there was a hospital in Richmond um, and several other cities. Um, the big surprise to me was the discovery, and uh, back to sources, um, the National Archives has a file call, called the Confederate Navy Subject File, and there's a lot of hidden stuff in there, and fortunately it was uh, a digital 
I could get it online. Didn't have to go to the National Archives. Um, and I found the journal kept by a doctor, a medical doctor, a physician called uh, Osborne Engelhart. And he was on the CSS Gaines, um, mostly in harbor during the war, um, as the surgeon on the, on the ship. And he kept a very, as I think a lot of doctors did, a very detailed journal of every patient, their age, their rating, and their country of origin. I tried to read what they were being given there weren't, in the Civil War, there weren't any pills. Almost everything that was medicine was, was mixed with water of some kind. It was, it was liquid. So all these measurements of medicine I didn't, had never heard of, <laughs> I tried to look up some of them. But for somebody who really could understand that and do it, it's, it's an absolutely amazing thing because he would say, this is what's wrong with the man. This is what I did. He was discharged. Or the one fellow was so very ill, they sent him to a receiving ship. He said, I can't. I can't take care of him anymore the way he should be taken care of. He needs to go somewhere else. But it's quite, it's quite something. Um, they used um, a lot of um, something called Dover's powder, um, a lot of something called, it was a blue pill. They used, of course, morphine. Um, and they did do surgery. They performed um, any kind of surgery, amputations, or whatever they had to do using chloroform because they found um, that it was more reliable, it had a better record, and it wasn't flammable. And at first I thought, huh? And I went, oh yeah, all you need to be doing on, is, on a ship <laughs> is something that could get your ship on fire because fire and boiler explosions were one of the really serious problems. Number of, um, there were a number of boiler explosions, and I guess I should kind of remind everybody that this was one of the first, well, considered the first modern war, and most of the ships were steam driven. And uh, so they had boilers and engine rooms. Um, and boiler explosions were not unheard of on both sides. And it kill a lot of people if your boiler explodes. Um, anyway, um, the uh, medical care I thought was really interesting. It, it, there, there's a, a good bit of medical history about the Civil War um, that you can draw on. Um, but it was really Engelhart's that, that someday somebody, maybe a graduate student, should go through the whole thing. It's, it's a long journal, many, many pages. I think over two or three years, and just track some of these fellows. But it was interesting be, to see their ages, what was wrong with them. And um, many of them were successfully treated and, 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 and released. You know, they went back to, they went back to duty. Um, he, I don't think he. I don't think he lost. I don't remember that he lost anybody. That any one of them died. Um, but it was the routine problem you have, you know, on a ship that wasn't going anywhere. But it was certainly in the harbor, and had to be ready if it had to go somewhere. So, anyway, um, the uh, oh, I had some fun stories um, <laughs> that I wanted to talk about. Um, the uh, ladies. Um, there is a whole lot in here about women, but um, and the ladies in Richmond used to come out occasionally uh, to meet, um, after a battle particularly, um, to meet uh, the wagons or carts that were carrying the wounded. And some of them, of course, were burying folks who had died. And um, I read that they used to carry, uh, like probably on a handkerchief or something, camphor in their pockets so they could go <laughs> because it smelled. <laughs> they wanted to be there, but they really didn't want to smell how terrible it was. But that was their solution, I guess, to, to dealing with it, but they were doing it. The other cute story I thought was a fellow was in the hospital, and um, they put him right near the front. So when people walked in, he would be right there. They said, you'd, be, you'd have better air and better light, and this is the perfect place for you. And he said, oh, no, no, please. Like, move me to the back. Uh, get me out of there. They said, well, what's wrong? This is, you've got the best spot. And he said, no, you don't understand. Every lady that comes through here washes my face and stuffs me with jelly. I guess they were giving them some kind of jelly. <laughs> and I keep telling them, the second person and the third and the whatever, I've already had my face washed. I've already had jelly. Stop. So she said, you've got to move me out of here so they'll leave me alone. And I thought, that is, uh, that is really amazing. It was nice to be taken care of, but he was overtaken care of, and he was done with it. Um, 
But um, we, so we don't have a, a lot of, I, I couldn't find a lot about people who had been in hospitals. There's one quote from a fellow who went to a naval hospital. He, uh, who, uh, he was a Union uh, sailor, and he went to a Confederate hospital, and he said he really thought it was quite a good place. He, I'm being taken well care of. Um, I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> But it was hard to find too many other people who were talking about whether the hospitals were good or bad. But evidently, medical care was really quite good um, during the war. Um, and um, except, except, and I want to talk about one of the one of the real shocks to me um, about I think the biggest shock about doing the research on this was about prisoner of war camps. Um, I don't know a lot about Union. Prisoners, uh, we all know about Andersonville, most of us, <laughs> and how terrible that was. Well, it turns out that some of the Union prisoner of war camps weren't a whole lot better, or maybe almost as bad, maybe not quite as big. Um, there were a number of um, uh, Confederates, sailors, and soldiers, too, that were taken prisoner during the war. Um, I have a figure somewhere of how many. Um, quite a lot, large number. Um, not as many naval personnel, obviously. Um, yeah. Um, the adjutant general at one report claimed that 214,865 Southerners, soldiers and sailors, were taken prisoner and confined um, at the, many of these. There's a map in the book um, that I wrote of some of the, both the Union and the Confederate prisons. Um, there was one um, at Camp Chase in Ohio. I want to talk about that. Elmira in New York, uh, Johnson's Island, Point Lookout, and Forts Warren, Delaware, um, all had uh, uh, fairly large prison situations for Confederate prisoners. Um, the uh, uh, biggest one was Point Lookout. Uh, it was 14, had surrounded by 14 foot walls. And it was a 40-acre campus, or camp, and it was guarded by African-American soldiers, Union. Um, and um, one man said they were insolent and they were cruel. <laughs> um, they were not happy with, with the guards that were guarding them. Um, I wonder why more of them didn't escape. Um, and some of them did try. They, you know, the usual, it happened in World War II, dig a tunnel, scale the walls, figure out how to get out of there. Um, but the one figure I found for um, Johnson's Island, there were 10,000 POWs there, and only 20 of them actually managed to escape. Um, one of them managed to get out and was caught. <laughs> um, the other thing that I guess I didn't realize, too, is particularly, well, really starting in 1862, um, Confederate prisoners were given a chance to do what they called swallowing the eagle. If you swallowed the eagle, you would take the oath of allegiance to the Union, and you would be released from prison. But you had to give up on the Confederacy. <laughs> and um, a lot of them didn't. A lot of them thought, it, particularly officers, thought it was an affront. We're not going to do that. We're loyal to the Confederacy. We're not going to do that. But those who did evidently got put in separate barracks. They were better beds, and they were treated better. And then the others started calling them Calvinized Yankees. Calvinized Yankees. Um, many of them ended up joining U.S. volunteer regiments and were posted, a lot of them, to the western frontier. Um, and it, according to one thing I read, thousands of these rebel POWs did this. And there's one instance uh, that talks about the Navy, one recruiter got 300 Navy men from a Union camp at Rock Island to enlist in the Union. Got them to Confederate Navy guys to, in other words, if you want to get out of prison bad enough. <laughs> and they did. A lot of them didn't, but a lot of them did. Um, I uh, think that the situation in a lot of these camps was, particularly Elmira uh, in New York, a lot of these Southerners had never lived in anything as cold as Elmira, New York, or Johnson's Island. Um, and they, they really didn't have adequate clothing. They were sometimes given clothing, sometimes one blanket. And a lot of, at one point, one fellow said, wrote home and said, um, you know, it, well, the, the winter of 1864-65 was one of the coldest, snowiest 
in recent history of, at that time. Very, very cold winter. And those that were there without enough heat, without the proper clothes, evidently the one fellow said dozens of them are, are, are dying every day. We're losing them every day because they're freezing or they're just dying from the cold and lack of, lack of medical care, lack of uh, <clears throat> proper food and you know, nutrition. Or bad drinking water. Several of these camps, uh, they got it fixed occasionally, but they had very foul drinking water. It was not a good place to be in many of these camps. However, and I was uh, saying a minute ago when I was downstairs looking at the sewing kits and whatever, that uh, <coughs> um, the prisoners were not making bone ships like they were down there uh, in, in those models, but they made their own furniture, they fashioned jewelry. They, a lot of them kept busy by fashioning jewelry, making jewelry they sent home or whatever, and, and kept busy. One of them, one of the prisoner of war camps, had a theater group called the Rebellions that put on shows. Um, they, they tried to keep busy and, and tried to keep entertained when they could. Um, but again, um, some of them, and it depended. Sometimes the rations were reduced. Sometimes they were okay. It depended on <coughs> which which month, which year, and which prison, you know, the conditions would, would vary. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, there's a lot in the book. I can't talk about it all. Um, I um, wanted to talk a little bit, though, um, about, um, about the whole legacy of, of, of the Confederate States Navy. Um, I'm very impressed, as I said, once I read more about it, that they were, they managed to build ships, lease ships, <coughs> arm them, man them, create um, a naval foundry and that produced the Brooke rifle, um, hospitals. Uh, they really started up from nowhere almost and um, managed to do, you know, quite a, I'm going to have to drink some water here, quite a, um, they had obviously lost at the end of the war, but they had some victories and um, some defeats. <coughs> um, there's an entire chapter in the book that I think could have been more, but you know you have to watch how many pages you're when you're doing this for some publisher um, about the fact that they were innovative. Stephen Mallory really thought that if you're a, um, um, a smaller navy trying to catch up and compete with the Union Navy, you needed to use whatever advantages you could. So one of the things they used a lot were what they called torpedoes, their mines. They were usually um, um, a battery and the guys would be on either side of the shore and when a ship would come along, they would connect the, the electricity and the mine would blow up. They weren't really contact mines. <laughs> which sank a number of ships, including the Cairo, which is, uh, was raised up from the Yazoo River and is now, at least most of it, at uh, Vicksburg, at the National Park in Vicksburg. Um, the other thing, of course, was the Hunley. Uh, that was the picture on the cover, is the picture of the Hunley. They found that somewhere, the publisher did, the Naval Institute Press. Um, the uh, submersible, the Hunley was a submersible. It did sink the Housatonic. Uh, they came up with spar torpedoes and a torpedo boat called the David, um, which exploded a torpedo against the New Ironsides, which was a Union um, armored ship. And the squib, which uh, damaged but failed to sink the um, Admiral's uh, flagship, the Minnesota. So they had some success with spar torpedoes and with these mines. Um, and of course, um, you have to talk quickly about about the real success, of course, was the 11 commerce raiders that the Confederate States Navy, and I, every time I read this, I'm kind of impressed, <laughs> which together, there were 11, destroyed or captured 252 merchantmen or whalers. They went out, to Shenandoah was out in the Pacific and went after a lot of the whaling fleet. Um, it really disrupted economic life. Um, the insurance rates skyrocketed, a lot of union um, or northern shipping was afraid to leave port. We don't want to send our ship out because it might be captured um, or taken prize, um, ransomed. Um, and uh, the other thing that it, it, it affected northern morale. Part of the idea was that Mallory said, if we can get these raiders out here doing this, 
not only can we get some prize money and reduce their shipping and keep them in port if they can, but we can induce a kind of war weariness about this. And the long war drags along. Um, just one example, the CSS Alabama, in 22 months of cruising, ransomed or took 60 ships. The Florida took 38 ships worth 10 times her initial cost. And the Shenandoah bag prizes worth over a million dollars. Um, you know, the Shenandoah was still at sea after the war ended because she didn't know the war was over. <laughs> so she was cruising for a while um, and continuing to take ships. Um, I think the other thing that is uh, important to understand is they, they did have victory at Pope's Run, at the Battle of Plum Point. Uh, the capture, one of the things I thought, you hear a lot about the Monitor and the Merrimack and Hampton Roads. Um, and maybe the Arkansas, uh, CSS Arkansas, um, you know, going through the, and the Mississippi going through the Union, the Union ships, um, and not, didn't really end up doing much, but did get through. Um, but the capture, I have a lot in the book about the capture of the USS Underwriter and the Water Witch. Both were very exciting, pretty successful Confederate actions. Um, but there were a lot of defeats. <laughs> and um, the only thing that um, I think Mallory and others pointed to at the end of the war was that they did, in fact, prevent U.S. forces from going up the James River all the way to Richmond. They had batteries um, at uh, Dury's Bluff before you get all the way to Richmond. And at uh, the war's end, uh, very interesting that when the ships were no longer available, a lot of the sailors and naval officers uh, became infantry, naval infantry, the Sims Naval Brigade, and the ones at Honey Hill, the Battle of Honey Hill, were called the IIs. And they were named that because when they came, you know, as naval infantry, every time the officer said something, the sailors said, aye, aye, sir. <laughs> and so they started calling them the aye, ayes, and they fought very bravely at that, at that particular battle late in uh, April 1865. Um, the other thing that I think um, was a legacy, too, of the war from the Confederate States Navy standpoint was the experience and medical knowledge that was gained by all of these Navy physicians and hospital stewards caring for all kinds of wounds, combat wounds, uh, accidents, um, how to use anesthesia, treating a lot of serious illnesses. And um, I think that they were able, therefore, people say, to much better serve patients in their communities after the war because of what they had learned. Some of them actually went on to become professors of medicine and chemistry. Well, I better end there. There's a lot more, but if you all have any questions or thoughts, um, yeah. Not very much. Uh, the, they had black pilots. Moses Dallas was one of them that actually was on one of those ships that was captured, and he was killed. Um, the yeah, well, the the Union Navy certainly did. <laughs> the Union Navy used contrabands a lot. Some ships were almost all black sailors. Um, the Navy really didn't want to do it. Uh, the, the Confederate Navy didn't really want to do it. Um, I think they did use, we know, I, we know they use African-American laundresses and nurses and cooks on hospital boats and in some of the hospitals. But then it was the South, so they would have had access to. Um, the other thing that I didn't really write about much in this, but on the other book and on the one that I'm working on now is how many of uh, African-Americans were turned out to be really good informants and spies <laughs> because they basically were not noticed. You know, they hung around and could hear what was going on, especially in the South, and then they'd tell the Union, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> I heard. <laughs> um, and they knew, they knew a lot of, of what was going on and, you know, they're building something or the ships are doing this or whatever. Yeah, they were, oh yeah, they were working in the shipyards and, and they were a great source of information, but particularly to the Union. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think there were many that were ever, that I could find out, that were on ships um, 
again, it was the, you know, it was the South and they didn't want them. Um, there was a lot of trouble in the North with friction between African American sailors on board ships, but they did a lot. They did a lot for the Union Navy by using them and rescuing them. Yeah. The original privateering situation didn't work out too well, the commerce raiders, so um, Mallory said, you know, we're going to have to build our own ships and, and do our own commerce raiders like, like the Florida and the Sumter. Um, but does that mean you talked about prizes? They, they took a ship? Oh, if they took prizes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you captured a ship, you could take it in, and if you could find a port that would let you bring it in, that was the other problem. Oh, and the other problem with that, too, was that these are um, a lot of these commerce raiders or ships that were out at sea for any length of time, um, they burned coal. And when you run out of coal, you have to use your sail if you have one. So you had to put into port frequently. And a lot of the ports did not recognize the in the Caribbean and stuff, did not recognize um, the Confederacy. Um, and the English wanted, of course, to be very neutral. So they didn't like the fact that James Bullock was having ships built in English shipyards. They had to get around the foreign uh, in, in, enlistment uh, um, that didn't want, if they remained neutral, the British didn't want um, the Confederacy to be recruiting you know, their men or people in England and building ships there. So they would build them and give them another name <laughs> and uh, send them off with a British crew and then they would get somewhere else and the American uh, Confederate sailors would come aboard and the captain and get around the, you know, that, that regulation. But... Uh, oh, no, I think most of it was... They, they were pretty much bound by the fact they had to be Northern northern merchant ships. Um, I don't know if there were any instances where they. Well, there was that one, Slidell and the other guy, that Mason and Slidell. They were Union though, but no, they weren't supposed to. They were supposed to take Union, you know, or not foreign ships. Um, prize money. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, one of the Confederate officers made a good deal of money, prize money. And the captain got more, but there was a whole, you know, according to the crew and, and, and your rating, but you could make hundreds of dollars, and so it was a big deal. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons they got so many people to enlist, is the idea that when $200 in those days was a lot of money for a lot of these sailors, um, and um, they hoped that they'd get prize money, didn't always get it. Um, and they were always trying to run the blockade. You know, the blockade runners, you had to either get out through the Union blockade um, to go sell your cotton somewhere else and then bring the supplies in. And I thought it was interesting. There are some records. Um, they sent, a, particularly from Mobile, the Confederate Navy sent a lot of... Um, ships um, to Cuba to supply medical, all kinds of things. And we do have some of the bills of lading that, you know, tell you what were on some of these ships, and then they would run the blockade into Mobile, and particularly Mobile, um, with supplies. So Cuba was really busy <laughs> supplying them with all kinds of stuff. But I think, they, I think they started to run out with, toward the end of the war. They were beginning to run out of things. Particularly clothing. There's a little bit in the book about the guy said, well, we, we just look terrible. It was officer. He said, you know, we've been wearing the same uniform <laughs> all this time. Oh, and I didn't mention the fact that the Confederate Navy wore gray. They called it Navy gray. And when they first decided that they were going to have this gray uniform, a lot of the officers that had gone south, that had been naval officers, said, I am not wearing gray. <laughs> this is not, we wear blue. <laughs> we wear navy blue, not gray. And they kept their blue uniforms on for a while until they had to get the others. But um, so you, when you see all those pictures, they're, they're wearing that navy gray, those navy gray 
um, uniforms. And they did, um, Sims, I think, talked a little bit about the fact that they were issued uh, some clothing, and if you wanted, the officers, if they wanted more and had money, Iverson, uh, the, the, both the Iverson boys were writing, the, we have their letters home to their mother saying, you know, I need white duck claw, I need white duck pants, and could you have another coat made, and whatever. Um, but the average sailor probably didn't have anybody or the money to have a tailor make his clothes. So they learned, they learned to sew. And there's a, I was looking downstairs at the little sewing kit, and that, and that they, they got very good at it. One of, one of those, I can't remember which, which officer it was, captain of one of the commerce raiders said, you know, they really, they can, they can really make their clothes and, and, and ribbons, and they be quite, quite, quite good at what they're doing because they had to. <laughs> um, if they wanted to fix things up, they, they had to do it on their own. Um, I didn't find out much about pets other than the cat in the, in the, in the, in the cannon, um, which I'm, I'm kind of sad about because I'm sure they had a lot of pets. Yeah. What about photography? What? Photography, pictures. I see oh. some of the battles, you know, on land, but never anything. I had some trouble finding stuff. Um, there are some pictures in there. Um, no, no movies. Obviously, <laughs> they didn't have those. Um, but there are some in the book. Um, let me see. Um, you can see. Not even paintings. Um, not too many paintings. I think maybe there are a few. Um, I I found as many as I could. Um, there are, yeah. See, there are some paintings. There's one of Fort Morgan and Fort Jackson. Uh, battles um, and uh, the Queen of the West, and I want, we have some pictures of well we have one of Jefferson Davis but um, there was one um, Stephen Mallory um, the uh, actually now that I'm looking at most of the pictures they aren't photographs <laughs> they're they're drawings or etchings yeah you're right. There's a picture of the Carondelet. Um, there's a picture of Raphael Sims and John Kell on the deck of the Alabama. And then his, with his officers on the Sumter. Um, I think I found, I think if you look at some of the biographies, they have pictures with their officers. But yeah, um, in Blue Jackets and Contrabands, the book you know, about the Union Navy, um, I did find more pictures, particularly of them on monitors. And, you know, there'd be a lot of white sailors, and then there's a black sailor. <laughs> um, so at least there were a few pictures of those. Um, but, yeah, given that it was such a photographed war, in a way, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know that the, uh, or they say that the Union had uh, really a problem with their officer corps and their generals early on. And, oh, their generals, that's for sure, yeah. The problem they had with the officer corps in the beginning is that, you know, the older ones resigned and there wasn't much for them to do. And so they created what was called a provisional navy. Mallory came up with this idea, let's have a provisional navy. And that allowed them to get more younger, more um, aggressive, younger, less old curmudgeon guys. <laughs> and then they would take the older fellows and put them in charge of naval stations and stuff, uh, you know. <laughs> um, so that, uh, yeah, it was a weird, this weird provisional Navy thing um, was the way they got around that. Um, I'm trying to think um, of any that were particularly, Buchanan, I you hear this and that about Buchanan. Um, and the Battle of Mobile Bay. Um, I mean, usually with a you know with a Union Navy, you think a lot other than the Commerce Raiders. You think more about about Farragut and Andrew Hall Foote and um, you know the admirals that in the Union Navy than you do in the in the in the, in the Confederate Navy. I think the other thing though um, that I that I found interesting was the fact that. Several several books I read said that Jefferson Davis was a land-minded president. 
He had no real understanding or support for the Navy, didn't understand about sea power. And they were very fortunate that Stephen Mallory, who had been chairman of the Naval Affairs Committee in the, you know, in the US, uh, a senator from Florida, took over the Navy Department from the beginning and did, uh, did amazing, amazing things. He really organized everything and he knew what he was doing. And it's sort of like, not quite like the Founding Fathers, but it's interesting that certain people with that kind of gift end up being in the right place at the right time. They could have had a really inept, <laughs> because as I said, Jefferson Davis evidently wasn't all that keen on any of it. Um, and I know that um, the, uh, I think the idea of being innovative, and we need to build steamships, we need to build modern ships, and we'll have them built, hopefully, in England, and ones that and, and arm them with brook rifles, and, and, uh, and of course, most of them were armored. Uh, there were some steel, they were steam driven, um, and uh, were much more, much more modern ships. And uh, it fascinates me that they were able to do that, that they were able to find the money and find the people in England or otherwise to do it. They leased a lot of ships at the beginning. When you start out with no Navy at all, you have to leave, lease something. Um, but, uh, and the union, the union did the same thing. They went from almost nothing to huge building programs. And of course, after the Monitor and the Merrimack, the CSS Virginia, really, um, that's the union called it the Merrimack, we called it the South, called it the Virginia, um, there was a big Monitor building craze after that, particularly in the union. Um, monitors are it, boy, you know, we want to have, uh, we want to have turrets and monitors um, and um, wooden ships are not not so good anymore. <laughs> um, so it, it it's an it, that's interesting from a you know from a technological standpoint what they were doing. Um, my uh, PhD PhD dissertation was the development of the steam navy, and one whole part of that dissertation was what the union did in building three or four hundred ships. They started out with almost nothing. And I love the downstairs, they've got some of the models. They've got a double ender gunboat down there. <laughs> Union. Um, wartime is the time when you really do need to be, think about technology, and particularly if you're an underdog. You know, you've, like I said, you've got to think about ways that you can attack um, a, a larger navy with more people. And uh, they were able to do that. Um, it's, it's kind of remarkable, really, and, and I think that writing the book gave me such a better um, understanding of the war, because all I'd ever done and much thought about was from the Union or the Union Navy standpoint, you know? I mean, the Southerners were like the enemy. <laughs> I don't really know, know anything about them. <laughs> um, and oh, and, and the one last, just a minute, uh, one last thing I forgot to say, um, I, when I started out, I was under the impression that in my family there were no rebels, none. Let, let that be a lesson to all of you. In somebody's family, on either, there's somebody on either side. So I said, no, 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 no. I don't know why, but nobody I know of. And at some point I was doing research on the family. A lot of the, my maiden name was Brooks, and a lot of the Brookses came from Kentucky. And at one point we found, I don't whether it was a Mitchell or a Brooks now, I found he was a Confederate cavalry officer in a Ken Kentucky unit. He was captured in a skirmish and he was sent to Camp Chase, Ohio. And we know exactly, I was telling my grandson, we know exactly what it was like when he got there in January of, I think it was 1864 or five. Um, it was the coldest winter for a long time at Camp Chase because someone else left letters or a journal describing exactly what it was like at Camp Chase on those dates. And I said, isn't that amazing that, you know, you've got a relative somewhere there, Theo, way back, who not only was a rebel, <laughs> he was at Camp Chase. Sorry, you had a question. The, uh, the America's Cup of the, I guess it was the America, that was used as a, 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 a blockade runner as Anna, I think. Yeah, Anna, yeah, you're right. That's right, Anna.
Did they do modifications? I don't know. That's a good question. I remember reading about it, but I really, I don't really know. Good thing to look up. Um, yeah. Oh, on the sea, that's a good point. Um, well, the Alabama and the Kearsage was, of course, right off the port in France. Mobile Bay was in Mobile Bay. Um, of course, that was a battle. There were several on the Mississippi River. Um, there was the Underwriter and the Water Witch, but those are in, in the rivers. Um, yeah, you really come to think of it. There wasn't one classic like in the American Revolution, you know, that we've got the painting downstairs um, with the French fleet. Um, the one, you know, the one that you think about is Plum Point um, and the one above, you know, off of New Orleans. Um, trying to think if I'm missing something there that would be really considered a naval battle with two sides. It was mostly a matter of blockade running or commerce raiders. Um, or like with the, uh, the underwriter, you're up a river and near New Bern, they're trying to take, you know, there are a lot of you, when you look at the southern coast, I never realized how many rivers <laughs> go inland there. Um, and same, of course, in the, in the west. Um, but in that case, with a lot of um, well, even Port Royal wasn't really a battle between two different fleets. It was more a matter of the invasion of the Union into Port Royal. No, I can't think of any. I'll have to go home and re rethink that, but nothing's coming to mind in a way. It's interesting, you're right. Mainly because probably you didn't have two real fleets. You had some at Mobile Bay because you had all of of the Union, um, who were, you know, going into Mobile Bay, and then you had uh, the Tennessee and defending the forts there. Uh, that wasn't what you would really call a fleet of, you know, it was not that many ships. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever run across, like, the captain's daily logs, or things like that, or not? I haven't. Um, I know there's some muster rolls. Um, I don't know whether the National Archives, they, they should have them. Then, and they might be in the Confederate Navy subject file. Um, there are some interesting things there. But it's really weird because it's digital and it kind of runs along the bottom, you know, and you have to kind of figure out, when, where was that? How do I get back there? But they should have kept them. There should have been some. There must be some. There must be some. Um, but, you know, the... The first lieutenant and the quartermaster always have to keep a daily log of the ship, but it doesn't tell you much more than the weather and something that happened. It doesn't, you know. Yeah, and, and I don't know. We have biographies or memoirs or autobiographies um, and biographies of, of a lot of the major um, Waddell and Semge and John Newland Maffitt. Um, you know, they've all been written about a lot. They were keeping, obviously, their own journal, or they were sending letters. So, but, but yeah, that's a good question. Think about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an interesting subject.